Okay, so uh, first an announcement. As you know, uh, there is a centralized organization of the seminars and uh, practical courses in computer science. And uh, if you want to attend a seminar or a practical course in the next semester, then you can register for these seminars uh, starting today until the 1st of July. And there's also a seminar offered by our group on uh, verification techniques. And these are techniques operating on different kinds of programs, for example, on functional programs, but also uh, on other kinds of programming languages. So uh, if you attended this lecture, then you are in some sense qualified to uh, attend the seminar as well. So if you like, then uh, you can register for this seminar. But you can, of course, also register for other seminars. So this starts today. Uh, OK, so this was the first announcement. Second announcement, I mentioned this already on Friday. Uh, on Wednesday, there will be lecture instead of exercise course. So there will be three lectures this week, but there will be no lecture next week. So we will have exercise courses next week and lectures this week. OK, so what did we do in the last lecture? We introduced lambda terms. And lambda terms, the lambda calculus, is a tiny little sub-language of Haskell or functional programming languages in general. And we use this tiny little language, for example, to, to implement Haskell. So we will write a kind of compiler which compiles Haskell programs, simple Haskell programs, to lambda terms. And then we only have to implement the lambda calculus, and that is pretty easy. So the lambda calculus is a very simple language. Historically, it was developed long before functional programming or long before programming languages in general. It was developed uh, for the same reason as Turing machines to express what computability means. So there are four different kinds of lambda terms. Constants are lambda terms. Hey, I started already. So constants are lambda terms. Uh, variables are lambda terms. And if you already have two lambda terms, T1 and T2, you can apply the first one to the second one. So you can write them beside each other, and that means application. And we have the lambda abstraction. So we can write a term like this. If x is a variable and t is a term, then lambda x dot t intuitively stands for the function that takes x as an argument and returns t as a result. So this all looks like Haskell, but it's in fact just a tiny little subset of Haskell. But this is sufficient to program any computable function. So we, uh, this was the syntax of lambda terms. And in order to introduce the semantics of lambda terms, we need the concept of substitution. And we defined this as well in the last lecture. So what does substitution mean? Substitution means that we replace free occurrences of a variable by a term. So this means, this, in, uh, this statement in square brackets means it's the substitution that replaces all free occurrences of the variable x by the term t. So if I apply this substitution to the variable x, I get t. And if I apply it to a different variable like y, nothing changes. I just stick with y. If I apply it to a constant, also nothing changes because, well, c doesn't contain any variables. If I apply it to an application, well, then the substitution is applied both to the first term in the application and to the second term in the application. And the interesting case is when I apply to a lambda abstraction. So if this is my lambda abstraction, lambda x dot r, then x is no longer free in this lambda term, but x is a bound variable. I mean, this stands for the function which maps an argument x to this term over here. And whether this argument is called x or whether it's called x prime, that doesn't really matter. So um, replacing x by t has no effect here because x is bound, and so I cannot replace it. So this term remains unchanged. If uh, the variable that is bound by the lambda is a different one, some variable y, then uh, I can apply the substitution on the body of the lambda term, provided that the variable that is bound here, so this y, this lambda y, does not occur free in t. So since it is pure, pure chance what the name of this bound variable is, uh, it should not happen that a free variable in t is suddenly bound by a lambda. And if this happens, so if t really uh, contains this variable y here, then we first perform a renaming of this bound variable. So we rename this y to a fresh variable y prime. So everywhere in R we have to replace y by y prime. 
and then we can apply the substitution of x by t. So this was the definition of substitution and now we started uh, defining the semantics of the lambda calculus and the semantics this time we defined it not in a denotational way but in an operational way. So we said how can you evaluate a lambda term to another lambda term and there will be three ways of doing this and they are denoted by Greek letters. The first way of evaluating lambda terms was called alpha reduction and alpha reduction just renames bound variables. So if I have some term lambda x dot t, I can rename this bound variable x to another bound variable y. So instead of lambda x dot t, I can write lambda y dot t, but now I have to rename all occurrences of x, all three occurrences of x by y. And of course I can do this not only on the top level of the term, but I can also do it uh, somewhere deep inside the term. So I can do it on left-hand sides of applications, I can do it on right-hand sides of applications, and I can also do this in the body of a lambda term. Now, of course, this does not really evaluate anything. It just replaces one term by another equivalent other term. The next reduction really does evaluation, and this is called beta reduction. And beta reduction tells us how to apply one lambda term, a lambda abstraction, to another term. So what happens if I apply a term like this, lambda x dot t, to some argument r? Well, this is the function that takes x and gives you t as a result. So the result will be t, but all occurrences of the formal parameter x must be replaced by r. So I get t with x substituted by r. And again, this can be performed not only on the top level of the term, but also deep inside the term in applications or uh, in lambda abstractions. So here are some examples. If I want to apply this lambda term to this argument, I mean this stands for the identity function. It's the function that takes x and returns x. So according to this definition, the result is x, the body of the lambda term, but all occurrences of x are replaced by zero. So the result is zero. And this works in the same way for more complicated terms. And we looked at that uh, in the last lecture. So now the question was, um, what are the properties of these reductions? In particular, what happens if I have a large lambda term? Then I can probably apply different forms of reductions. In particular, I might apply beta reduction inside, somewhere inside the term or somewhere outside in the term. And the question is, do I always get the same result? And to formulate this, we introduce the notion of confluence. And what does confluence mean? A relation is called confluence if it has the following property. Suppose I have some object t, or in this case some term t, and I can evaluate it in two different ways. So I can evaluate it to some, to some result q1 and to some result q2, and they may be different. That's okay, but the question is, uh, is this a real indeterminism? Or can I resolve this indeterminism again? And confluence means that whenever this happens, I can resolve the indeterminism again. I can continue with my evaluation of Q1 and Q2 and reach a new common result. So there is some common result Q and I can come from Q1 to Q and also from Q2 to Q in arbitrary many steps. So confluence means if the solid arrows hold, then the dashed arrows hold as well. And why is confluence interesting? Well, confluence is interesting because if a relation is confluent, if beta reduction, for example, is confluent, then the result of the evaluation is unique. And the result of the evaluation was called normal form. A normal form is a term which you cannot evaluate further. And it's easy to prove the following lemma. And this is where we stopped in the last lecture. So uh, this lemma says that if we have confluence, then we also have unique results. We have unique normal forms. So confluence implies unique normal forms. So, and this in fact holds for arbitrary relations, not just for beta reduction and not just for relations on terms, but for any kind of relation. So suppose we have some relation which is confluent let this be a confluent re relation. 
let this be a confluent relation on some set n. So this relation puts objects of, of the set n into uh, correspondence. And then the claim is, if this relation is confluent, then every object has at most one normal form. So then every object T from the set N has at most one normal form. At most one normal form. So let's prove it. Well, so suppose T has two normal forms. So suppose that T has two normal forms. And well, no, if T has a normal form, that means that I can start evaluating T until I cannot continue any further. So I can start with evaluating T, and I can reach one normal form Q1 and another normal form Q2. And my goal is to prove that they are the same. So I know the relation is confluent. And confluence means that uh, I can join these two results again. I, so there's a common result Q so that I can evaluate Q1 to Q and also Q2 to Q. So by confluence, by confluence, there is some object Q, and I can join them again. So I can come from Q1 to Q, and also from Q2 to Q. But now I know that Q1 and Q2 are normal forms. So since Q1 and Q2 are normal forms, and a normal form is something that I cannot evaluate further. So this does not stand in relation with anything else. And so that means I cannot apply one or more steps here. I can only apply zero steps here. So Q1 cannot be evaluated further. And that means Q1 must be equal to Q. And also Q2 must be equal to Q. So they must be equal, well, and then Q1 is equal to Q2. So if T has two normal forms, well, then these two normal forms are equal. So confluence is what we would really like to have. And indeed, beta reduction is confluent. And that's a famous result, which is not completely trivial. And it is due to, well, Church, who invented the Lambda Calculus and his student Rossa. So this is uh, the theorem of Church and Rossa. Let me write this down. So this is the theorem 3, 2, 5. Uh, the theorem of Church and Rossa. And they proved that the Lambda Calculus with beta reduction is confluent. So they proved that this is confluent. So this means if I can go from T to Q1 with beta reduction, and I can go from T to Q2 with beta reduction, then I can join them again. Well, actually, I can join them up to alpha reduction. So I can make sure that from Q onwards, I reach a term. From Q1 onwards, I reach a term Q. And here, I reach a term Q prime. And Q and Q prime are the same up to the names of bound variables. So then there exist two terms, Q and Q prime. They are both lambda terms. And uh, I can come from Q1 
to Q. I can come from Q2 to Q prime. And Q and Q prime are almost the same. So Q and Q prime, they only differ by the names of their bound variables. So I can convert them into each other by, by alpha reduction. So if you want to depict this graphically, then it looks like this. If I can come from T by beta reduction to Q1 and also to Q2, then I can join them again by going to Q here and to Q prime here. Well, and they are identical up to alpha reduction. And alpha reduction, well, terms that only differ by the names of their bound variables, they are considered to be equivalent. Whether you write lambda x dot x or lambda y dot y, that makes no real difference. Sorry? It doesn't fit the definition of confluence. Well, they should be identical if, if it's confluent. So, okay, it's confluent up to alpha reduction. So then, it's, then it fits the definition. Well, people regard this as, as identical. I mean, whether you write this or whether you write this. I mean, this is the identity function and this is the identity function. So this is normally considered to be almost the same. But if you take this really uh, literally, then you're right. Then it's not confluent, but confluent up to alpha reduction. OK, this is not completely trivial to prove. And we won't prove it here. But uh, this is an important theorem. Telephone. So it's an important theorem because it tells us if, if I evaluate in a different way, so if I, if I change the strategy, then of course this can influence termination and it can influence efficiency, but it cannot influence the, the result. So it cannot happen that if you evaluate in, in the one way, you get zero as a result, and if you evaluate in the other way, you get one as a result. That cannot happen. Now, we introduced alpha and beta reduction, and we need one more reduction. And you might expect that the next reduction is called gamma, but that's not true. The next reduction is called delta. Don't ask me why. So gamma reduction is completely unknown. I have no idea why uh, Church chose uh, alpha, beta, and delta. So there is an eta reduction also, but gamma, I don't know. So there's delta reduction. And uh, delta reduction is, is there to handle the, the constants. So you remember that in a lambda term, you have variables and applications and lambda abstractions, but you also have constants. And these constants, they stand for predefined functions. So all the predefined functions that we want to have, we have to add them as constants. And then, of course, we also need to know what these predefined functions do, what, what, should, be their, what should be their implementation. And that is uh, realized by delta rules. So there is another form of reduction, namely delta reduction. And this is used. Uh, to determine this determines how to evaluate terms that are uh, built with constants and we built delta we built lambda terms over some set of constants, uh, calligraphic C. And of course, so, so we will simply add a set of delta rules. And these delta rules, they uh, describe what these constants mean. But we will not allow to formulate these delta rules in a completely arbitrary way, because we don't want to destroy confluence. I mean, up to now, beta reduction is confluent. And when we add these delta rules, we want that confluence is maintained. So. We define uh, the behavior of these, of these constants by a set of delta rules. By a set of delta rules. 
but uh, but we restrict the form of these rules in order to maintain confluence. We restrict the form of delta rules in order to maintain confluence. So we don't want to destroy confluence by these delta rules. And in general, if we, if we would allow arbitrary rules, then confluence would immediately be lost. So for example, suppose we have some, some constant c. So c is one of the constants from this uh, constant set. And now suppose we allowed uh, rules like this. So c x y may be reduced to x, but c x y may also be reduced to y. So if we would allow rules like this, then of course we lose confluence immediately because already this term c x y, well, it could be reduced to two different new terms, x and y. And x and y are normal forms. There is no rule applicable to x and y anymore. So c x y would suddenly have two different normal forms which would not be allowed. So this is not allowed. So to make sure that confluence is maintained, we define delta rules as follows. And this also defines the delta reduction. So delta reduction is based on a certain set of rules delta, which describes what our constants mean. So A set of rules, and this set is called small delta, of the following form. So all of these rules have the following form. They start, they have one lambda term on the left hand side and one lambda term on the right hand side and an arrow in between. And the lambda term on the left hand side starts with some constant. So the outermost, the outermost term here is a constant c. And c is applied to t1 and c t1 is applied to t2 and 2tn, and on the right hand side we have some other lambda term r. And here c is a constant, and t1, 2tn, and also r, they are lambda terms. So a set of rules of this form is called a delta rule set if it, certis if it satisfies certain conditions. It's called A delta rule set if it satisfies the following condition. If it satisfies the following conditions. So The first condition is, is uh, the following. All these terms here in the arguments, so this t1 to tn, and also the term on the right hand side, they may not have free variables. So t1 to tn and, uh, and r, they, they must be closed lambda terms. They must be closed lambda terms. And closed means they have no free variables. Now, why is this required? Well, otherwise, we could, for example, have things like Cx goes to 0, and Cx goes to 1. And uh, that's, of course, already pretty bad, because we could now apply this to, to any term starting with c, and we could reduce this to both 0 and 1, and this would destroy confluence. So, so this is not allowed. But this is not enough to guarantee confluence. Moreover, we require that 
these terms here on the left hand side, this T1 to Tn, they must be in beta normal form. So they are all in beta normal form. In other words, it, it must not be possible to reduce these terms further by beta reduction. So they are all in beta normal form. And moreover, they may not contain a left hand side of another rule in our rule set. And, and they do not contain any left hand side of a rule from delta. So why is this required? Well, first, first let's look at the first condition. The first condition says that all the arguments must be in beta normal form. Well, if we would not require this, we could, for example, have a rule like this. C applied to, uh, well, lambda x dot 0 applied to 1. This thing reduces to 0, but C of 1 reduces to 1. So if these were our two rules, then I claim that this destroys confluence. Why does this destroy confluence? Well, if I have this strange looking term, so C of lambda x dot 0 applied to 1. So this term I could reduce to 0 using this first rule. So by this delta rule, I could reduce it to 0. But I could also do something else. I could also first apply a beta reduction rule and reduce this argument. So lambda x dot 0 applied to 1. Uh, shouldn't have written it like this. So uh, lambda x dot 0 applied to 1, what's the result of this? Well, lambda x dot 0 maps any argument to 0. So if I apply this to 1, it maps it to 0. So this uh, gives me c of 0 by beta reduction. And now, if I apply the second rule, I get the result 1. That's a delta reduction step. And so I can see that I can reduce this term to 0, but I can also reduce it to 1. And I cannot join this anymore. That's the end. So I have destroyed confluence. I have two different normal forms, and that's bad. I don't want to destroy confluence. So it's not a good idea to allow arguments that can still be reduced further. So that's the reason for requiring that all these arguments here are in beta normal form. And why do I require the second thing? So why don't I allow left-hand sides of other rules uh, in the left-hand sides? Well, let's do another counterexample. So suppose again that, well, C0 goes to 0, C of D goes to 1, and D goes to 0. So why is this bad? Well, this also destroys confluence. So if I start with C of D, I could go to 1 directly using the second rule. But I could also reduce this D first. And then I get C0. And C0 goes to 0. So again, I have destroyed confluence because CD can be reduced both to 1 and to 0. And that's the end. I cannot join this anymore. And I need. One more condition, namely, the rules may not overlap. So there are no two different rules of the following form. So one rule looks like this, C T1 to Tn goes to R. And the other one has the same arguments, but probably more than that. So C of T1 to Tm 
equals to r prime and m is greater or equal to n. So this is also bad. Why? So if I wouldn't forbid this, then I could have the following counterexample for confluence. C0 goes to 0. C applied to 0 and 1 goes to 1. And well, why is this bad? Why does this destroy confluence? Well, if I, if I start with this term, C01, now I could, for example, reduce this C0 here only. Then I get 0 applied to 1. Or I reduce the whole thing, and then I get 1. And so here I have 0 applied to 1, which I cannot reduce further. And here I have 1, which I cannot reduce further either. And that's the end. I cannot join it. So these conditions are clearly necessary for ensuring confluence. And well, let's finish the definition. So now we say that delta reduction means that I can apply these rules anywhere. I can apply them on the top level of the term, but I can also apply them somewhere deep inside the term. So for such a set, delta, we define the delta reduction arrow delta as the smallest relation as the smallest relation with the following properties. So if I have a delta rule L arrow R in delta, then I say that L can be reduced by delta reduction to R. And moreover, if I can do this somewhere inside the term, then that's also OK. So if I can reduce T1 to T2 by delta reduction, then I can also do this on the left-hand side of an application and on the right-hand side of an application. And also in the body of a lambda abstraction. And the relation that we will use for evaluation of lambda terms will now be the union of beta reduction and delta reduction. And to save some writing, we write arrow with uh, the index beta delta. That's the union of beta reduction and delta reduction. So this will be the relation that we will use for evaluating lambda terms. OK, so let's look at an example for delta rules. But first, I have to wipe a board. So how could an example for a delta rule set look like? for a delta rule set? Well, for example, we could have rules to evaluate one of the predefined functions that we need when translating complex Haskell to simple Haskell. I mean, there we have to get rid of pattern matching, and we need lots of is a uh, and arc of functions to recognize data constructors. For example, we had a function is a uh, suck which is uh, needed to find out whether a term is built with this data constructor here. So if it is built with this data constructor, then it should return true. So this would be allowed. But uh, well, if you look at these conditions, we see that the left-hand side has to be a closed lambda term. So t cannot be a variable. 
I mean, that's, that's what you would like to write. So is a suck of suck x goes to true. But that's not allowed by delta rules. So the solution is, well, we have not one of these rules, but infinitely many. For every closed term t, which is in beta and delta normal form, we add this rule. So we have infinitely many of them. But of course, we can represent them in a finite way. So that's not really a problem for implementation. In the implementation, we simply check, is there a term like this, where this argument is closed and in normal form? And if so, yes, then we can apply this rule. So we have this rule whenever t is a lambda term, which is closed and in beta delta normal form. Closed and in beta delta normal form. And then we need another is a rule, because if I apply this to the wrong constructor, 0, then it should return false, of course. So if I, return, if I apply it to 0, it should return false. So these would be the rules, the delta rules for a function like is a successor to find out whether, well, to, to represent pattern matching uh, against this data constructor. And this really satisfies all these criteria up there. And indeed, one can extend this theorem of Church and Rossa from just beta reduction to beta and delta reduction. So if I obey all these rules up there, then uh, beta delta reduction is also confluent. So that's the following theorem. So it tells us that the lambda calculus is confluent is confluent if I use both beta and delta rules. So again, beta delta is confluent up to uh, alpha reduction. It's confluent up to alpha reduction. So again, this means if I have a t and I go with beta delta to one term q1 and with beta delta to another term q2, then I can join them again. So I can go from here to some term q and from here to some term q prime. And they are almost identical up to the renaming of bound variables. OK, so now uh, we have introduced essentially the semantics of the lambda calculus. So the semantics of the lambda calculus is given by these reduction rules, mainly beta and delta. And it says, how can I evaluate predefined operations? And how can I evaluate the application of lambda abstractions to other terms? And that's more or less it. And well, the only question that remains is that uh, we have to think about the strategy. I mean, we have confluence, but still, uh, although it is confluent, it can happen that one reduction terminates if you use one evaluation strategy, and if you use the other re uh, evaluation strategy, it does not terminate. And if we want to implement Haskell, then of course, we have to make a decision. I mean, should, which kind of evaluation strategy do we want to use? Because the program has, eventually has to terminate or not to terminate, and this has to correspond to the desired semantics of Haskell. So that's what we still have to do. But maybe uh, one more historical remark. So as I said, uh, the lambda calculus was invented by Church in the 1930s to uh, model what computability means. And he historically had another reduction rule, so not just alpha, beta, and delta. He also had eta reduction. And eta reduction we will not use for implementing Haskell, but uh, just to show you that there are more reductions. So Church, but not we, he also used eta reduction. So eta reduction. And what does eta reduction do? So in case you're interested, eta reduction simplifies things like this. So if you have a term like this, lambda x t applied to x. No.
if you have this term, this is the function that w waits for an argument x and then gives you back tx. Now this you can write in a simpler way. I mean, think for example of the function, let's say this is square root. The function that waits for an argument and then applies square root to it. How can you write the same thing in a simpler way? You can just write square root without this lambda thing before. It does the same thing. And this is what eta reduction does. So eta reduction simplifies this like that. So if you, instead of having this unnecessary lambda in front of it and this x behind it, you can just reduce this to this function. So instead of writing this, you can simply write square root. This does the same thing. And this reduction we will not use because, uh, well, why don't we use this? I mean, it, it makes, intuitively this makes sense, but we don't want to use it because uh, the question is, well, when do we want to stop the evaluation? Do we want to continue evaluating till, till the very end or do we want to stop at some point? And we will stop at some point. So to implement Haskell using the Lambda calculus, So the question is, uh, which evaluation strategy do we want to use? Do we want to use for the lambda calculus? And the question is also, when do we want to stop? Do we really want to evaluate until we reach normal forms, or do we want to stop earlier? When do we want to stop the evaluation? And it will turn out that as soon as we reach a term starting with a lambda, we stop the evaluation. So we will stop when we reach a term whose outermost symbol is a lambda. when reaching a term of the form lambda x dot something. And therefore, eta reduction is not used. So this eta reduction will not be used when we implement functional languages. But I mean, semantically, it makes sense because indeed this term and this term, they express the same thing. So what I showed to you now was the operational semantics of the lambda calculus. There is also a denotational semantics of the lambda calculus, and that is very similar to uh, what we did for Haskell. So in fact, this denotational semantics that I presented to you for Haskell was first developed for the lambda calculus and then uh, extended to Haskell. So that's exactly the same idea. And so I wanted to show you both a denotational semantics, we did that for Haskell, and then operational semantics, we did that for the lambda calculus. But you could do both kinds of semantics for both kinds of languages. OK, so let's move on further and really implement Haskell. And to implement Haskell, what we have to do is we have to compile it to some lambda term. So every Haskell program has to be compiled to some lambda term. And then this lambda term has to be evaluated using beta and delta reduction. And we have to choose the right evaluation strategy. And we have to decide when to stop the evaluation. OK, that's what we are going to do in the next subsection after I wipe the board. OK, <clears throat> so we now come to the reduction or compilation of Haskell to the lambda calculus. So reducing Haskell to the lambda calculus. So the goal is find an automatic translation to translate Haskell expressions to lambda terms. To lambda terms. 
And this is the kind of compilation. And the lambda calculus you can see as the machine language of uh, functional programming. And then this is executed using reductions, using beta and delta reduction. Then evaluate the resulting lambda term by beta and delta reduction. And well, this should work for any expression or for any program. In particular, you can write non-terminating programs. So it should be possible also to uh, translate non-terminating programs accurately to lambda terms. And then these lambda terms have to be non-terminating as well. I mean, the point is that the lambda calculus is a full programming language. And in a full programming language, you can write non-terminating programs, as you might have experienced yourself. So uh, this is possible in Haskell for sure. And this should be possible in the lambda calculus as well. So just to, to give you an example, how would a term look like that does not terminate? So clearly, the lambda calculus is confluent, is confluent but not terminating. But not terminating. And in fact, even if you don't have delta rules, then still, even with the beta rules, it's not terminating. So even the beta rules alone is not terminating. Why? Now that's maybe surprising at first sight. Because you might imagine, well, beta, I mean, beta does this. You, you take a lambda abstraction and apply it to an argument. So at first sight, you might think, well, somehow this term gets smaller, right? I mean, here you, here you have one lambda more than here. That's what you might think. But that's not necessarily true, because this x can occur several times in this t. And this r can also contain lambdas. And so it can happen that this term here has the same number of lambdas or even more lambdas than this over here. So let's think of, of some term where we see that things can be non-terminating. So in order to, to have this, we somehow have to, well, we get rid of one lambda. So uh, we have to produce lambdas again. And this can only be done by having this x several times in the right-hand side. So for example, let's do this. So this beautiful term means uh, I take some function x and uh, I re return the following result. I apply x to itself. Now, applying something to itself is always something very strange. And well, this term is strange enough on its own. But to make it even stranger, let's apply this term to itself. So I apply lambda x dot xx to lambda x dot xx. I mean, in, Haskell, in, in lambda calculus, this is possible. You can, I mean, this is a legal Haskell edge. Uh, sorry, this is a legal lambda term. And this is a legal lambda term as well. And I can apply every lambda term to every lambda, lambda term. So I can write this down. I mean, the semantics of this is strange, but uh, I can write it down. And now I can apply beta reduction. Because uh, beta reduction has a clear definition, namely this one here. So what's, what's the result of applying this? Well, I get the body of this thing. So I get xx. But uh, in here, in this body, I have to replace all occurrences of x by the argument. So I have to replace all occurrences of x by this argument here. So by lambda x dot xx. And what's that? So I have to replace the first x by lambda x dot xx. So this gives me lambda x dot xx. And I have to replace the second x also by lambda x dot xx. And now if I compare the term that I started with with the term that I reached, I see not much difference. So yeah, by beta reduction, I can reduce this term to itself. And now clearly, this is non-terminating because I can repeat this again and again. So this shows, this nasty uh, little term shows that beta reduction is not terminating. Of course, there are many more examples where it's not terminating. But I think this is the easiest one. You can come up with more complicated ones easily. But, uh, and typically, uh, all of these terms that are as ugly as this, uh, they have some kind of, of self-application. I mean, this has lots of self-applications. x is applied to itself, and this whole term is applied to itself. And these self-applications are nasty, because if we later on try to do type checking, 
then it will turn out that these terms are not well typed. I mean, if you write this in Haskell, I mean, in Haskell, you can write lambda. It's just the backslash. If you write this in Haskell, Haskell will reject this and will say this is not well typed. And indeed, if you have just well typed lambda terms, then they are terminating. But uh, non well typed lambda terms, they can have this ugly behavior. And at the moment, we didn't speak about types. So at the moment, we just have lambda terms. We can write them down. And you can see that, obviously, they are, you can write something down which is not terminating. OK, that's, that's good, because we want to translate any Haskell program to a lambda term. And we also want to translate non-terminating Haskell programs accurately. And then we need these strange kinds of lambda terms, because, well, they are not terminating, and that might be good. And then, of course, uh, once we have this, you can also think of lambda terms where it depends on the evaluation strategy, if they are terminating or not. I mean, that can now be done easily. So there are also lambda terms where termination depends on the evaluation strategy. On the evaluation strategy. And well, why is this? For example, if I have this lambda x dot y, that looks rather harmless. And this I applied to this nasty term over here. So lambda x dot y is applied to the term lambda x dot xx applied to lambda x dot xx. And now uh, I have two possibilities. I can either apply beta reduction on the outside. So I apply this term to this. And then the result is y. And all occurrences of x are replaced by this nasty term over here. But there is no occurrence of x. So by just one single beta step, I can go to y. And then that's the end. So this evaluation is terminating. So, or I do an innermost evaluation. And I keep this on the outside. But I evaluate the term on the inside. And if I evaluate this, we have already seen uh, this evaluates to itself. So this evaluates to itself. And so if I keep on continuing, all, and I always want to evaluate the innermost term, then this will not terminate. So this has an infinite evaluation here. So we can see that innermost evaluation is non-terminating and outermost evaluation is terminating in this example. So innermost evaluation is non-terminating whereas outermost evaluation is terminating. And, and so we have to make a decision. When we want to implement Haskell, we cannot say, well, we don't care about the evaluation strategy because the termination behavior must be determined. I mean, we, we must uniquely determine whether something terminates or not. And so we have to fix the evaluation strategy. And of course, well, since we want to implement Haskell, we will take the outermost evaluation strategy because Haskell relies on this idea of outermost evaluation strategy. And so, to implement Haskell, we will take leftmost outermost evaluation. We use uh, the beta delta reduction with leftmost outermost evaluation strategy. With with leftmost outermost strategy. And this, this strategy is, is safe in the sense that if a term has a normal form, then this strategy will find it. Whereas innermost strategy does not necessarily find it. I mean, here in this example, the term that we started with has a normal form. So this term here has a normal form, namely y. And outermost reduction finds it, but innermost reduction does not find it, but runs into uh, an infinite evaluation. 
So this is the strategy that we will use. And this answers the question of the evaluation strategy. But the other question is, when do we want to stop? So should we really go on evaluating until we reach the normal form, or should we stop before? And it turns out that we don't go until we reach the normal form, but we stop a little earlier. Moreover, we do not evaluate until we reach a normal form. We do not always, I mean sometimes we do evaluate until we reach normal form, but we do not always evaluate to normal form. So the idea is we only evaluate until we reach the, the outermost function symbol of the result. So as soon as we know the outermost function symbol of the result and we know that this cannot change anymore, then we stop the evaluation essentially. So the idea is uh, if the evaluation reaches a term that starts with some, some function symbol f, f of t1 to tn, and where we know that f can never be evaluated further, where it is clear that f can never be evaluated further, then we have in some sense determined the head of the term. So this is the head of the term. And as soon as we determine this head of the term, we, we stop and we don't evaluate the arguments anymore. So we stop and do not evaluate the arguments any further. And do not evaluate the arguments uh, T1 to Tn any further. So, so as an example, suppose we have the following term. So here I, I use the predefined list constructors, or you can also write it in a prefix notation. So this is the colon operator, uh, the list constructor, and the first argument is 1 plus 2, and the second argument is the empty list. And for Haskell, this and this is the same. And so now what is the outermost function symbol? The outermost function symbol is colon. So the outermost symbol is colon. And colon is a data constructor. So we know that colon can never be evaluated further. The arguments could be evaluated further. This 1 plus 2 could be evaluated further to 3. But we don't do this anymore. We stop at this point, And this will be needed for, for pattern matching. Because pattern matching works in that way. Uh, if we have to evaluate an argument, we don't evaluate it completely. We evaluate it only until we know the constructor on the head, on the top position. And then this is sufficient to continue with the pattern matching. So here we stop and we don't continue evaluating any further. So the outermost symbol, a colon, is a data constructor. And therefore, here we stop and do not evaluate the subterm 1 plus 2 further. And well, how do we determine these uh, constructors? Well, these are, the con these are the function symbols for which we do not have any delta rules. And the same thing is done uh, if the outermost symbol is a lambda. So similarly, we also do not evaluate 
any terms of the form lambda x dot something further. Even though it might be possible to apply rules to this body t, but we don't do this anymore. And we call the terms where we stop the evaluation, we say they are in weak hat normal form. So let me define this. This is definition 331, weak hat normal form. So we say that uh, a term, a lambda term t is in, well, this is abbreviated WHNF for weak hat normal form. This is in weak hat normal form if it has one of the following forms. It starts with a lambda. So this has the form lambda x dot something for some variable x and some term r. Or it has the form c t1 to tn. And c is a constructor. Well, we don't have the notion of constructor anymore in the lambda calculus. But we know the delta rules. And the delta rules, they tell us how to evaluate certain functions. And if there is no delta rule for C, then C must be a constructor which cannot be evaluated further. So T1 to Tn are arbitrary lambda terms. And C is a constant. where. Uh, There is no rule for C in the corresponding delta rule set. So delta is the set of rules that we have. And in this delta rule set, there is no rule for C. So this means C is a constructor. And there's another possibility, so there's a third possibility for weak at normal forms, namely if the outermost symbol is not a constructor but a variable. So if it has the form x applied to t1 to tn, where t1 to tn are terms and x is a variable. Because also here, the, the outermost symbol is determined. This can never be applied anymore because, well, there is no rule to apply a variable to, to something else. And these arguments might be, it might be possible to evaluate the arguments further, but we don't do this. We stop at this point. And now we can define the relation that we use for evaluating Haskell. So we first translate Haskell to a lambda term. How to do this, that still remains to be discussed. But once we have done it, we take this lambda term and we evaluate it using leftmost outermost reduction with beta, beta and delta rules. And we stop as soon as we reach weak hat normal form. And this is called weak hat normal order reduction. So now we can define the relation that is used to evaluate Haskell, or more precisely, to evaluate the lambda terms that Haskell is compiled to, used for evaluating Haskell, or respectively, the lambda terms that Haskell programs are compiled to, that Haskell expressions are compiled to. And this is called weak hat normal order reduction.
And how is this defined? So the weak hat normal order reduction on lambda terms is defined as follows. On lambda terms is defined as follows. We say that T can be evaluated to R. Well, we can only continue the evaluation if T is not yet in weak hat normal form. So we only do this if T is not in weak hat normal form. Oh, uh, I forgot one condition of up there. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, if, if T is a normal form, then we also stop. So here yeah, I forgot one important condition. Of course, we stop if T is a normal form. So everything that is in normal form is also in weak at normal form. But moreover, we stop as soon as the leading symbol of T is determined. So the leading symbol is lambda or a constructor or a variable. But if it's a normal form, then of course it's also in weak at normal form. So what is weak at normal order reduction? Well, we can only continue if T is not in weak at normal form. And then what do we do? Well, we apply beta and delta reduction. And we do beta delta reduction to R. And the evaluation strategy is not arbitrary, but it's leftmost outermost. So where the reduction is applied with a leftmost outermost strategy. With left most outermost strategy. So we have now determined the relation to evaluate these lambda terms. So what remains to be discussed for the implementation of Haskell is how do we compile Haskell to lambda terms. And once we have done that, then they can be evaluated like this. And this is not difficult to implement. I mean, the only thing you have to do is you have to implement beta and delta reduction with the right strategy, and that's it. So this is not too difficult. And also the translation from uh, Haskell to lambda calculus is also not so difficult. So for the implementation of Haskell, for implementing Haskell, it remains to define, well, the translation from Haskell to lambda calculus, or the compilation of Haskell expressions to lambda terms of, of Haskell expressions to lambda terms. And we will do this by a function which I call lam. So what lam does is it takes a Haskell expression as an input. So this is the set of simple Haskell expressions. And it returns a lambda term. And the lambda term should do the same thing as this Haskell expression. And well, what are the difficulties? So what do we have in simple Haskell, what we do not have in lambda calculus? Well, if we think of simple Haskell, what are the problems? So which concepts of simple Haskell are missing in the lambda calculus? Which concepts of simple Haskell are missing in the lambda calculus?
because, well, the lambda calculus is again a restriction which restricts even further than just simple Haskell. Well, if you want to know, we can look up the definition of simple Haskell and see what we had there. So here is the definition of simple Haskell. And we can go through it and see what simple Haskell has and what the lambda calculus has not. So maybe I put on the definition of the of lambda terms as well. So you can see the definition of lambda terms is shorter, so something must be missing. So variables. A Haskell expression can be, can be a variable. Well, variables we have in the lambda calculus as well. So that's nothing new. So variables can be kept as they are. Now here we have data constructors. Well, data constructors, they will be considered as constants. So these constants we have in the lambda calculus as well. And similarly for integers, floating points, and characters, they will all be considered as constants. So these constants we have in the lambda calculus as well, so everything up to here, we need no special translation. This exists in the lambda calculus as well. Here we have a concept that does not exist in the lambda calculus, namely the concept of tuples. In the lambda calculus, there are no tuples. This is not a tuple. This is an application. So a tuple does not exist. So we have to translate tuples in some way. Then what's the next thing? Well, the next thing are applications. Now, applications we have in the lambda calculus as well, so that's not a problem. Then we have if, then, else. OK, if, then, else we don't have in the lambda calculus, but that doesn't look too difficult. So if, then, else we do not have. And, and then we have this. Let var equal x in x. That's the main problem, because uh, here we declare, we have some, some kind of function declaration. And, and the bad thing is that could be a recursive declaration. And of course, in all interesting Haskell programs, this is recursive. So we have recursive function definitions. And that's the main thing that we don't have in the lambda calculus. And so this is, this is the main problem, how to translate this into uh, a lambda term. So possibly recursive function declarations. So that's the main thing that we don't have. And of course, this, uh, how to translate this into lambda calculus is trivial. Backslash is replaced by lambda, and arrow is replaced by dot. So that's, that's no challenge. So the, the challenge is uh, to translate these three concepts where these two are easy, and this is the only thing where something interesting is happening. OK, so that's uh, what we have to do. So let's start with the easy stuff. So how? let's do this step by step. If we have a variable, so how could the expression look like? Now, the first expression is a variable. Now, every variable that is a Haskell expression is simply translated into the corresponding variable of the lambda calculus. So there's really nothing to do. So we define lamb as follows. If the expression is a variable, then this remains unchanged. So this is simply a variable of the lambda calculus then. So nothing happens here. And Now, what about data constructors? So if I have a data constructor, or if I have an integer, floating point number, or character, so if I have something like this, so let's C be a data constructor, or an integer, or a floating point number, or a character. Well, this is just kept as it is. So this is considered as a constant of the lambda calculus. Of the lambda calculus. So we need 
an appropriate set of, of constants for the lambda calculus. This, if this is our set of constants, then what should it contain? It should contain all constructors. So con should be the set of all constructors of, uh, of the program. So all user-defined data constructors, but also all the integers, all the floating points, all the characters. And uh, it will also contain all the predefined operations. And the predefined operations we put into some set C0. And these are the predefined functions of Haskell. So something like square root or plus or minus or whatever. All the predefined functions of Haskell. So they will be considered as constants and all the data constructors will be considered as constants as well. So for these variables, if they are really, if they are predefined, then they end up in C. And if they are not predefined, then they end up as a variable of the lambda calculus. So nothing really new is happening here. The interesting things come afterwards when we have tuples or if then else or possibly recursive functions. OK, since uh, I think we, we do this in the next lecture. But before I stop, uh, I'd like to make two announcements. So, uh, so the first announcement concerns, uh, because several students asked me about what is called Schwerpunkt Colloquium in German. Uh, OK, I, I can probably translate this to English, but since it only concerns people studying uh, in, the master in the German master program, there's probably no need to translate this. So anyway, this is a kind of oral exam uh, where you focus on, on certain topics. So this is called Schwerpunkt Colloquium. And people ask me uh, how, how to do this uh, and how to integrate this lecture, for example, into their Schwerpunkt Colloquium. I, for, so for the English speaking, this is a difficult word. And if you can pronounce this, then your uh, German pronunciation is already pretty good. So uh, OK, so some, some uh, information concerning this Schwerpunkt Colloquium. So you can, in general, combine different lectures, also different lectures of different professors in this Schwerpunkt Colloquium. So this can contain lectures of different professors. So it can contain lectures of just one professor, but also of different ones. Lectures of one or more professors. And it's also possible to do these Schwerpunkt Colloquia together with two professors. So if you want to select some lectures from Professor A and some lectures from Professor B, you can contact them and ask them, do you want to do this together? And then maybe they say yes. So this can be, and most likely they say yes. So it can be done by one or more professors, in, so they can really do this uh, together. And it should contain, it should contain more than two lectures, where the number of lectures doesn't have to be an integer. So it can also be something like 2.5 lectures. So you can discuss with these professors whether what is added to these two lectures. So this can be a little bit more of another lecture. It can be part of a seminar. So discuss with the people what to do. And uh, yeah, so in particular, uh, this means if you want to combine this lecture with other lectures, they can be lectures which I gave, but they can also be lectures which other people gave. And you can contact me and discuss this. And we can see how to find a solution. So this is the first thing I wanted to mention. And the other thing is that on Wednesday, we have a lecture instead of exercise course. And consequently, the exercise sheet number eight, which if you see what's written on it, it says it's due on Wednesday. So this is postponed, and you have time until next Monday to finish it. So exercise sheet eight uh, is, well, you can submit it on Wednesday if you want. But if you want, you can also wait until Monday next week. OK, so that's it. So see you again on Wednesday. <laughs>